Um, uh, the week before, we spoke about father. Last week, we spoke about sons and daughters. And we said a few things about what, he, what, it's, what it means to be a son and a daughter of God. Um, so something happened this morning that I think is very relevant. So I, I was leaving the house, you know, heading to church uh, this uh, morning. It, and it was a little bit early, uh, my, you know, around 8 something coming down here. And I see that uh, I'm getting a call on my phone, and it's my wife. Now, for those of you that know my wife is not around, uh, so I answer the phone, and my wife is there with my daughter. Now, they don't call me on Sunday mornings. And I'm looking at their faces, and my wife says, Eden wanted, wanted to, to, to talk to you. So it turns out that all morning, their time, Eden had been saying dada that she wants to talk to to to, to me and i i'm like hey how you doing da, da, da. and she's she's going on her own thing she gives me a few minutes and then she walks away to go do something else but here's the thing because i was sitting out there thinking about it even as before, before i walked up here it was special to me for one reason the girl herself wanted to speak to me okay so what happened was, now, we don't have a scheduled time for her to talk to me. This is not our scheduled time, because we have the scheduled time when we talk to each other. This is not our scheduled time. And she randomly is disturbing her mom to speak to me. Um, and it wasn't just once. She wanted to talk to me. And she didn't have a lot of things to say. She didn't have a lot of things to ask. She just wanted to say hi. And as a father, that made me feel good. It made me feel almost special. Like I was like, and she's just a little kid, but I, I feel special. Like, whoa, wow, she, she likes me that much. Um, you know, now the kid is just two years old. This year she'll be three, but she's just two. But I felt because it came from the depths of her heart. It wasn't something where no one had to tell her, now you have to talk to your dad. No, the girl just wanted to. And it showed me that, oh, whoa, so we're being in a relationship. All right, so this girl actually, you know, she understands that her, because, you know, one thing that she says now, she says, my dada. So she puts my in front of it now, which is like, which makes me feel good. It makes me feel good. Now, why do I say all this? If that's how me as a young person, as a human being, if that's how my little daughter saying, she, calling me randomly, wanted to speak to me, if that's how it makes me feel good, imagine, imagine how it is for the God of the universe. Imagine what it, how it would be if we just wanted to speak to him. Now, I will ask you a question, but I want you to answer it to yourself. If you're online, answer this question yourself too, in your mind, right? Or you can write it down. When was the last time you spoke to God, not about anything, but just to say hi? When was the last time you just spoke to, hey, just want to say hi? Or when was the last time you just spoke to him just to say thank you? You didn't ask for one thing. You had no request. You had nothing to ask for. You just wanted to say thank you. I just want to say, hey, I like the birds that you made. When was the last time we did that? When was the last time we did that? Now, these things are important because it shows how, because, you know, this morning, the fact that she called me herself, or she wanted to call me herself, but she couldn't, so her mom had to come. Now, I imagine if she had her own cell phone, she would have called me herself. But she couldn't, so she kept disturbing her mom till her mom called me. And it wasn't the first time she kept asking her mom, and her mom called me. The fact that she herself decided to do that shows that we have a relationship. Shows that she sees me a certain way where she actually wants to talk to me, not because of any other thing, but just because she likes me. Is that how we feel about God? Do we love God to that extent? 
where we say we are children of God, right? That's what everybody keeps saying. But do we love God to the extent where we just want to talk to God, not because we have any issue, but just because he's God? We just want to talk to our father just because he's our father. So today we're going to look at the second part of what it means to be a son of, or a child of God. Second part, what is also called fundamentals, simply because of the end of today's message. So the end of today's message is going to, uh, is the reason why it is called fundamentals. All right, cool. So let's, let's go back and let's look at a few things quickly. Let's go to somewhere that we looked at last week. We're going to just take a quick refresher and then we'll go to where we need to go to. Let's go to Romans 8. Romans 8 from verse 1 to 10. Romans 8 from verse 1 to 10. So here's what it says. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, as we said before, there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, which means if you're not in Christ Jesus, this condemnation already. It says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. So he was sent for sin so that he can condemn sin in the flesh. He could die to sin. He could die for our iniquity. Verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So we spoke about last week the fact that this stuff is done for you that is wor not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. This is why the issue and the problem that folks have when it comes to Christianity, you know, there is a, there is a doctrine that is not understood that people keep repeating, but it's not fully understood. And that is the idea of once saved, always saved. Folks talk about it, but they don't even understand what that doctrine means. Or they talk about it, but they don't even explore the doctrine well. So they repeat it, and they repeat the words, and then they, it gives them the, it tells them, or their understanding of the doctrine is, well, I'm saved, thereby I can do whatever I want with my life. Well, not true, because right here, here's what Scripture says. Let's look at it one more time. Verse 4. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. They said the righteous requirement of the Lord has been fulfilled in you, who is not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Because how do you know it has been fulfilled in you? You are not walking according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. You cannot have the spirit and God in you controlling you, and then you walk according to the flesh. That makes no sense. So the point is this, the salvation that we have, if you are truly saved in Christ and you're walking, you will walk according to the Spirit of God and not according to your flesh. Okay? So this is what he says. He says, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. And then he says, verse 5, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. So, Scripture, I love how practical the Bible is. It is telling you how you can know if you're living according to the flesh. It says, if you are living according to the flesh, the most important things to you are going to be in this world. Let me say that again. The Bible is telling you that if you are living according, how do you know? Because everyone assumes they live according to the spirit. Oh, I'm a Christian. I'm saved by grace. Great. The Bible is saying this. If you are living according to the flesh, your mind will be set on things of the flesh. It's the reason why Jesus Christ tells you not to put your treasure on earth. Because where your treasure is, your heart will be also. You see that? That's it. Your mind will be set on things of this world. That is how you know you're walking according to the flesh. Why? Because the Spirit of God will not set your mind on things of the flesh, on things in this world. This is so important for believers to understand. The Spirit of God will not set your mind on things that don't glorify God. Okay, well, let's continue. And then it says, so let's look at that verse 5, then we'll go to verse 6. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the, to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. 
what are things of the flesh and things of the spirit? That's, <laughs> well, we might, we might look at that today. So let's look at verse 6. For to set the mind on things of the flesh is death. So this is not a joke. This is not a joke. Now, let's stop there for a second. I, I want to I make a statement. The problem a lot of people have is this. They think because a lot of people are doing something, it means it's good. They think because a lot of people agree on something, that that thing is righteous. Or that thing is not as bad. Why? Because, hey, everybody can be wrong. Yes, everybody can be wrong. And I realized this a long time ago when I looked at the story of Noah. God gave a word. People did not believe it. The family that believed God saved and destroyed everybody else. God did not change his word because people did not believe. He destroyed the ones that did not believe and kept the ones that believed his word. Simple. God's word is yea and amen. It will not change based off of what you choose to believe. Very important. Very important. Our God is not bipolar. His emotions are not up and down. He's not constantly changing his mind. When he has said something, he has said it. Now, if he gives you, now there are certain things that God might say, and then in, in his grace, he gives an environment wherein what you do might make him change certain things. But if God has said that the soul that sin it shall die, that is what will happen, unless someone comes to die for you. Okay, let's continue. And then it says, okay, so seven says, for the mind is set on the, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. See, this is not a joke. It says, you are hostile to God whether you realize it or not. Why? Because everything you produce will be flesh-based, will not glorify him. That's hostility to God. There is a sense that says, I am my own God, because you are set on your flesh and not on the king of kings. It says, it says, for the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. So the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God because you reject the law of God. You reject the law of God. Isn't it? No father or mother will ever say their child is obedient that constantly disobey them. No father or mother will say their child is obedient that constantly disobeys them. Or just does whatever they want. Tell your child to do this. Hey, yeah, you know, make your bed. You go back, you come back, you go out to work, you come back at night, the bed is messed up. The house is, the house is even worse. They didn't make their bed, they even destroyed the entire house. They went to your own room and they, they messed up your own bed too. And they come, oh, you know what, you're a great child. You obeyed me. No. That is a sense of hostility. It shows a disregard. No honor. We looked at the book of Malachi 1 last week where God says, a son honors his father. God did not say a, a son may honor his father. He says a son honors his father. In God's perspective, a son honors his father. Then God says, if I'm, uh, then says also, a slave his master. He says, if I am a father to you, where is my honor? All right, so, so let's finish this. So we're looking at verse uh, verse 7. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. It says it's impossible. The mind that is set on the flesh, your flesh will never make you submit yourself to God. It will never happen. Sin would never allow you to submit yourself to God. Never. Since the very nature of sin is rebellion. It is rebellion against whatever God said. So it can never ever push you to ever submit. So wherever sin leads you will always be disobedient to what God has said. You will always be an enemy of God, wherever sin leads you. So now, let's look at verse 8. 
those who are in the flesh cannot please God. He didn't say may not. He didn't say, well, maybe. No, no. He says it's impossible. You can't please God. You can't do it. You can't do it. And this is why you might do good deeds. You might feed the hungry. You might take care of the poor. You might be there for the widows. You might do everything Jesus has told you to do in Scripture and you will still not please God. Why? Because you are walking in flesh. There is no submission to the Spirit of God. So though you're doing what we know is good, we all agree it's good. To God, it's not good. We all benefit from it. It's like when somebody comes to church and they give the offering and tithes. Glory be to God. The church will use it. But it doesn't mean God took it. It doesn't mean it was acceptable to God. It just meant we all used it, but it doesn't mean the king of king, kings accepted it. This is a heart issue. It doesn't matter what your neighbor does. What your neighbor does does not matter. All that matters is who are you before the king of kings? That's all that matters. My opinion of you does not matter. I can think about, I can look at you one way and say, oh, you're the... But I can think that you're great. It doesn't matter. All that matters is how does God see you. All right, let's continue. And then it says, now verse 9. <laughs> I love how Apostle Paul takes the time. First of all, lets them know. Then he takes the time to now tell them who they are. He says, you, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Now, but he doesn't just end there. He says, if, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you. It says, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if the Spirit of God dwells in you. So, so he's not just writing a blanket check for them and saying, well, you are all. He's not writing to the Roman church and saying, well, you are all in the Spirit. Because how would he know? It says, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. It says, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. So how do you know that you're a son of God? Do you have the Spirit of the Son of God? How do you know that you're a son of God? Do you have the spirit of the son of God? But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. It says, though your body is dead because of sin, which means, you know what's so funny how, <laughs> I love how scripture puts this, this stuff here. It says that your body is dead because of sin. It says, but your spirit is alive unto righteousness, right? But what is the thing that we take care of the most? We take care of a dead body. Wake up, take a shower, make sure you, you know, everything we do, we take care of this. Your clothes, everything, right? You want to be presentable. And that's great. No one's saying you shouldn't do that. But do you take care of the inner man as much as you take care of the outer man? You wake up in the morning, right? No one has to tell you to, to wash your mouth. But you do it. If you're going somewhere, you take a shower. No one has to tell you you wear clothes. You do all these things because you... You know you got to take care of yourself. But what do you do for the inner man, the person that really matters? What do you do? Oh, that one is, eh, it's not compulsory. Mm, I can choose to. And eh, do I really want to pray today? Mm, well, eh, maybe not. Do I want to open the, eh. Man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeded from the mouth of the Lord, of God. Now, here's what's interesting about that. Scripture didn't say man shall not live by bread. It says man shall not live by bread alone. Which means you can take care of this, but you got to take care of the inner man. Because this man, this one, is dead. If the person inside lives today, this outside will be returned to dust. The reason... Why this outside is alive is because of the person inside. This outside is already dead. It's the person inside that gives the outside life. So when the inside is gone, the outside goes to its natural state. But we take care of the outside so much, we ignore the inside. Why? Because we don't see the inside. 
even though the inside is you. <laughs> but <laughs> that's a whole different thing. So let's continue. Okay, so verse 10 says, But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. It says, if Christ is in you. So it says, if Christ is in you, the spirit is alive because of righteousness. Now, here's the, here's the thing. If Christ is not in you, your spirit is dead. So you're just a walking dead. Your body is dead. Your spirit is dead. You're just walking. But it says, if Christ is in you, your body is dead, but your spirit is alive. Now, verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, who raised, it says, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, let's look at Ephesians 1. And then we'll get to where we need to get to in the next five minutes. Ephesians 1. And let's look at from verse 11. You know, there was a video I was going to play this morning, but, you know, technically, from a technical perspective, the video would have played, but you would not have heard the sound. So I was like, ah, <laughs> let's, let's, let's try to, let's wait till, till we solve that issue. Then maybe someday I'll play it. Uh, ver, uh, Ephesians 1 verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Counsel of his will. Verse 12. So that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, believed in him, and were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now verse 12. Who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? So he says, if you heard the gospel and you got saved, he said you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, and the seal of the Holy Spirit is the guarantee that you will make it on the last day. The seal of the Holy Spirit. So do you have the Holy Spirit? Remember, if you walk according to the Spirit... Your life. You don't walk according to the Spirit, you're dead. Do you have the Holy Spirit? Last week we looked at and said, okay, how do we know that we have the Holy Spirit? And we, we took the time to go to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. So let's look at that quickly, even while we go to the... I want to make sure I don't ignore this one today. Galatians chapter 5. And we're going to look at from verse 16, Galatians 5, 16. Now, we said, how do you know you're walking in the flesh? And, or how do you know you're walking according to the Spirit of God? Well, Galatians, Galatians 5, um, verse uh, 15 to 16 of 15 all the way down shows us. So, so let's look at it. So let's start from verse 15. Galatians 5, 15. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not also consumed by one another. Now verse 16. But I say walk by the Spirit. See? So how do you know you're walking by the Spirit? He's going to show you right now. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. It says if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And as we said before, your flesh will never, never push you to glorify God. It will never happen. You will never do anything in flesh and it will glorify God. It cannot happen. And if you look at what he says, he says, if you walk by spirit, he says, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Because what the flesh wants, the desires of the flesh, don't align with what the spirit of God wants. So look at verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. Opposites. And they don't attract at all. For, though, for these are opposed to one another. To keep you from doing the things you want to do. So, hold on. Let's stop there. Because I think this is interesting. 
If you are led by the Spirit, you will not do the things you want to do in flesh. If you are led by the flesh, you will not do the things you want to do in spirit. You see that? Opposed to one another, so that the things, you don't do it. Because you are being led a different way. One is leading you left, one is leading you right. They are not coming, they are not going to ever cross paths. Ever. It will never happen. So when you come across that thing that you think, because sometimes we believe that the end of a thing, oh, the result of the thing, you know, proves whether it was right or wrong. Nope. You can have wonderful results to you, and it is still wrong in the sight of God. You can have results where men will clap for you, and they will think you have a righteous result. And to God, it was trash. It was sin. Why? Because your flesh. So let's continue. Verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. It's now saying, that's how you know what you're working in. He says, sexual immorality, adultery, fornication. If you are porn, sleeping with someone else's husband or someone else's wife, having sex before marriage, before you've made a commitment before God to the person, shows what you are walking in. If you believe that these things are normal and this is the life you want to live, it shows you're walking in flesh. My job is not here to tell you you're not walking in flesh. My job is to tell you what it is, and you make a decision on who you want to walk in. All right? I'm not here to look at you and say, well, you're a terrible person. No. Scripture has already said it. Let's, let's continue this word. It says this. It says, it says, it says, now the works, now this is verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sexuality, idolatry. Now, let me stop there because, you know, I would suggest take the time and go and look at the definition of each of these words, right? We don't have the time to explore that today. Maybe someday we'll do that, but not today. Look at every one of these words and break down and see if this is evident in your life. But I want to talk about idolatry because this is one of the things that a lot of people think that they're not doing. But so many people are doing it. God said that we should have no other God before him. Why? Because he's a jealous God. That, that's how God, I, I didn't say God was jealous. God defined himself as what? Jealous God. The sense is that God doesn't want you having nothing else before him. Here is what we don't understand about idolatry. Idolatry is not you carving wood and bowing before it. Idolatry is anything you put before God. Most of us are serving idols. And our idols are our money. Oh, money has become a massive idol in this world. Social media now is an idol. All the things we crave, we make idols of these things. You tell someone, hey, come fellowship. You know? There's nothing wrong with them, but they have a football game to watch. They can't come to the house of God and fellowship with believers. Why? Because the football game, after all, church will be there next week. What is that? What is that? Your dad invites you to come to his house. Hey, come. The family is coming together. And then you tell dad, ah, I've got a game. It's important, you know, I, you know what's so funny? I said that just now. I, it's today the, the, the uh, Super Bowl, right? I, just, I, did, I didn't even know. <laughs> After I said that, I was like, wait, isn't today Super Bowl? Okay, yeah. So we thank God. So, and, and I think that's so interesting in how we look at this. We have created so many idols in our lives. Some of us, you know, there are people that are their kids that are their idols. An idol is whatever you have chosen as this is the most important thing to me. You work for that thing. You do everything for that thing. Scripture tells us, and this is why we are so far away. And remember, I've said this a few times to some brothers. We are so far away from the standard of Scripture that when someone says it, it sounds like the person is insane. 
The Bible tells you to do everything as to unto the Lord. Say that to the emperor, like, how does that look like? You do everything as to the Lord. He's the reason why you do it. Why do I take up my family? Because of him. He has put me in this position to take up my family. And he has given me the responsibility as a man to take up my family. This is why I do it. Why do I love my wife? Because he said I should love my wife. Not because she was nice to me, but because he said I should love my wife. So I will love my wife. Even when she annoys me. Why should I be submissive to my husband? Because he said I should. But when God is not our reasoning anymore, we all decide what we want. We all decide what we want. But let's continue. I <sighs> don't know how the time flew so fast. Okay, so let's idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, feasts of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like this. Now, someone would say, well, hey, that particular thing, Scripture doesn't say it. You know, hey, how do I know this is sin? After all, Scripture doesn't say that that's the work of the flesh. <laughs> Look at the end of this passage. It says, and things like this. So if the thing you're talking about falls into and it looks like this, this is why porn, you don't have to tell, does it look like this? Okay, yeah, it is part of this. Anything like this. Okay, so it says, I warn you as I warned you before. So this is not the first time he's telling them. And those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. It says they will not. Even if they said I was saved. It says they will not. Why? Because what you produce says what is in you. The flesh or the spirit. Don't tell me you have the spirit in you and everything you produce is the flesh. What is that? What, what, what salvation did you get? And then it says, and those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now verse 22, but the fruit of the spirits. How do you know? It's one fruit. Not many. One. So it has all these things. Now you might be growing in different aspects of it, but you should be seeing growth. It says this. It's love. Do you love people? Do you love your neighbor? I'm not saying love your wife or husband. Do you love your neighbor? Joy. Are you easily saddened? Or do you trust God? So much so that when, even when the house is falling down, you know you have the spirit of God in you, so you trust the one who keeps you. You see, when we do everything as to unto God, you know that joy becomes easy. The problem is this. When you think you're in control, it's hard to find joy. When you do it as to unto, you realize, hey, I'm not in control of this. I'm working for him. Everything, Lord, I leave to you. It's easy to, to have joy. Because even while everything's burning, you know he's in control. I may not get it, but I know he understands. He knows what's happening. I will bring my request to him. Now, let me say something about joy. I know this is not even a message about joy, but I want to quickly say this. Joy does not mean you don't cry. Is there a thing about, like, uh, tears of joy? <laughs> so funny, right? You have so much joy that you start shedding <laughs> Start shedding tears. Okay, so I'm not going to have, I, I want to skip to this quickly. I'll go to the, the place I really wanted us to go to, but it seems like we can't. Uh, let's look at 2 Timothy, verse 4. For some reason, I thought I would have way more time, but 2 Timothy, verse 4. 1 to 5. It says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead. And by the appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Now, this is Apostle Paul writing to Timothy. And he says, reprove, rebuke, and exalt with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when, when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. He says a time is coming and that time has already come. 
when men will no longer want sound teaching anymore. They will no longer want to know truth. What they want is what they want. This is the kind of truth I am looking for. Thereby, this is what I will take. But here's the thing. The thing about truth is truth does not ask you what you think is true. It gives you facts. Then you decide what you want to believe. But it says the time is coming when men, this is not what they will seek. But he tells him, though, he says, he doesn't tell him to stop. He tells him to preach. Now let's look at John 8. Because there's a statement I want to make as I round up here now. John 8, verse 38. John 8, verse 38. John 8, verse 38. And it says, I speak of what I have seen and, and what I have seen with my father and what, and you do what you have heard. He said, I speak of what I have seen with my father and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered and said, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. It says, you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, but I heard from God, it's a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God, and this is what Abraham, and this is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, "We are not born of sexual immorality. You have," he says, "We have one father, even God." Jesus said to them, "If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but He who sent me. But He sent me." Verse forty-three. For why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Verse 45. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth... Why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not believe me is that you are not of God. Here's the thing, right? You can't say you are of God and the truth annoys you. You can't say you are of God, but what you're seeking is not to understand what God has said, but you just want to hear what you want to hear. A child of God wants to understand what your father is saying. It's like, okay, cool. How do I know that that is true? Well, I, I want to see it. This is what the Berean Jews did. They heard and they went back and studied their word. Not building for themselves teachers that would just give them the same things they want to hear every week. Give them a bunch of affirmations that mean nothing. If the same things you are listening to are the same things an unbeliever will hear and be charged up with, then there's a problem. There's a problem. Because we know that the spirit of God and flesh cannot coexist. They cannot produce the same kind of material. Let's look at the book of Luke. And this is the final passage we'll look at today as we round up with prayer. Luke 6, verse 46. Jesus makes a profound statement here that I think every believer should take to heart. Luke 6, verse 46, Jesus says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you? Now, if you continue, he then tells you what it looks like when you come and listen to what he says. But isn't that interesting? Why is it that we, we talk about we're children of God, but then we don't want to listen to what God says? We don't want to look and say, Lord, how do I change? Lord, how do I bend my knee? Help me. No, we are saying, Lord, you bend your word. You change your perspective, God. You change what you've said. Not me changing, you change. Well, I thought he was the unchangeable changer. I thought he's the one that can change you and not himself changing. Brothers and sisters, I tell you this. You cannot be a true child of God until you submit yourself to the Spirit of God. 
You cannot be a true child of God until you understand that the word of God is good for you. That even when the word of God contradicts what you want to believe, even when the word of God charges you up, that is what it's supposed to do. That is what it's supposed to do. Let's rise up. This morning, I want us to pray. I want us to pray. Just come before the Lord this morning and just say, Lord, help me to submit myself to you, Lord. If you're a child of God and you have the Spirit of God in you, ask the Lord, say, Lord, help me to submit myself to you. Help me to surrender my will before you. Help me, Lord, to love your word. Help me, Lord, that I will not, I will not gather for myself teachers. I will not walk according to my flesh. Because I know your spirit cannot produce anything that seems similar to my flesh. Your spirit will, 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 will charge me to go beyond, beyond what I can do. Say, Lord, help me. Now, if, you, if, you, if you're not sure you have the spirit of God, this is, this is the best time. This is the best time. There's a reason why, why we're talking about this today. There's a reason why God has allowed us to talk about this today. He has given us an opportunity. It is never too late as long as you are breathing. If you are still on this earth, it is not too late. It is not too late. The Lord has given you another second. He has given you another minute to join his family. If you know you haven't met the Lord, this is the best time. Just say, Lord, I come before you this morning and I surrender. I surrender to you. I ask you to change my heart. Help me to love you. Help me to love your word. Help me to seek you. Help me to seek you. I know what you have done with your son. I know what you've done, that you, 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 you sent your son to die for my sin. Lord, have mercy upon me. Bring me into your family. This is the time to open your mouth and speak to the Lord as, however you want. Open your mouth and speak to the Lord. Tell him the things you want to tell him. He's your father. When my daughter called me this morning, she didn't have much to say. <laughs> she didn't have a long story. But guess what? I felt good because it was from her heart. It was true. There was no fake reading it. She wasn't being cajoled. No one told her, oh, you have to do this now. There was no timetable. She just wanted to talk to her dad. She just wanted to see his face and say hi. This is an opportunity to just tell the Lord, say, Lord, I want to love you more. I want to love you to that extent. I want to love you wherein this is not something I, I do. This is who I am. My relationship with you will be solid, solid relationship. I will see you clear. We give you glory. We thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you, Lord, for your mercies. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We come before you, Lord, as children. We ask you to take control. Help us, Lord, to follow you. Help us, Lord, to surrender all that we are. Lord, may we not be so caught up with ourselves that we choose to change your word. But help us, Lord, to submit ourselves to your authority. Help us, Lord, to follow your spirit that we will not walk according to flesh. For in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.